My name is Robin Blumenthal and I'm with Fort Tucson as the Education Domain Director and I'm so glad all of you could join us. Uh, we have uh, Eric from Gateways to Better Education today and I'm going to let him tell you he has a lot of uh, things that he've done, uh, very passionate, a lot of changes he's made in the national education world. So I'm going to let him tell you more about that but let me answer a couple questions that often pop up uh, right away in the chat. Um, we will share a recording of this training that'll be available for about two weeks and that will come out probably Monday, uh, depending on how quick that gets generated from Zoom. Um, Eric will also share the PDF of this PowerPoint and the article which much of this information um, stems from. And then I will also within that uh, share a certificate for those of you who need professional development hours um, and notification. So other than that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Eric. Um, so you can go ahead and get started and tell us a little bit more about yourself and take it away. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be with all of you and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, Gateways to Better Education is about equipping Christians in public schools. And if you want more information about what we do and all the resources we provide, you can visit our website at gogateways.org. And uh, the idea is we really minister to the body of Christ on a public school campus. So we reach out and help uh, parents navigate the schools uh, so that their kids graduate with their faith and values not only intact, but stronger. We help uh, educators understand what the law really says and how to teach about the Bible and Christianity and do it in ways that are within constitutional guidance and, and appropriate for the academics of the, of the school. We help school administrators and, and board members with how to have policies and practices that are promoting uh, religious freedom for all. And uh, so that's in a nutshell of what we do. We, we work all across the country and I was just I'm de delighted that we're addressing this issue of um, really the whole child. So often in whole child education, you hear about the uh, emotional health and social needs of students beyond just the academics. But what they are, what's always missing and what I call the whole in whole child education is the spiritual whole. And I find that there are two ways that uh, we can address the issue of religion. So often, it's all about what do we teach about religion as an academic goal. And that's often where the, the arguments come up is to, you know, how much of the Bible should we teach or how much religion should we focus on? And what's the difference between teaching about religion and the teaching of religion? And this is where you see a lot of the debates. But what we're going to talk about today is engaging religion as an academic and behavioral asset for the classroom. And my argument is that if a school, because of a flawed view of the separation of church and state, does not welcome and affirm a student's religious background and, and make that something that's part of who they are in their learning, then they're really leaving an academic asset off the table. So we're gonna be going through some of the research on that today, and then uh, looking at how you can discuss this with others that are in your sphere of influence. Uh, the uh, National Survey on Drug Use and Health has come out with the fact that in their surveys, they found 69% of students ages 12 through 17 indicate that religious belief, their religious beliefs are a very important part of their life, which is shocking to a lot of people, but that's what the uh, national research says. Uh, so we can look at the academic asset aspects, and here's what uh, one study found. Findings indicate that Latino students who actively attended church or who saw their religious faith as very important to their lives achieved higher uh, grades in school, stayed on track in school, had less trouble with teachers and other students and homework and identified with school more strongly than did other Latino students. Religious practice was especially important for the educational success of Latino youth living in impoverished neighborhoods. So. Uh, and there's the footnote. And when I send out the uh, PDF uh, notes of this presentation and the article that uh, accompanies this, then you'll have the, the access to those actual articles. And another uh, study, relationship between family religious behaviors and child well-being among third grade children, family attendance at religious and spiritual programs was significantly correlated with improved child health, vocabulary, reading, math, and social skills which is surprising. I mean, I could understand social skills, but math and reading, yeah. 
Dr. William James of California State University in Long Beach reviewed studies involving over 50,000 students and wrote a report entitled The Relationship Between Bible Literacy and Behavioral and Academic Outcomes in Urban Areas. What he found was the results indicate that increased Bible knowledge is associated with higher levels of student academic achievement and positive behavioral patterns. Stanford University's Graduate School of Education found that students who practice their religion on a regular basis have an average GPA of 3.21 compared to 2.92 for those with no religion. And they said this pattern holds after accounting for race, religious denomination, sex, mother's educational level, and income. That's from a 2018 report. Dr. James did another meta-analysis of over a million students, and he came to this conclusion looking for what best reduces the achievement gap in students. Of all the variables under study for their relationship with reducing the achievement gap, religious faith had the highest effect size for reducing the, religious, uh, the achievement gap. So again, just support that says when students have a religious background, that is helping them academically. And we also have studies showing it's helping behaviorally. Our whole point then is a school can just make a more welcoming, affirming environment for them. That's not establishing a religion that to use uh, current terminology, that's being culturally inclusive, culturally uh, relevant. It's also supportive of college readiness. Uh, a study, uh, two studies actually found any religious affiliation increased the odds of college enrollment compared to being unaffiliated. Also found religiosity during adolescence has a significant effect on total number of years of schooling attained. Again, this is not so that our public schools now encourage people to go to church. It's not about um, proselytizing, no altar calls to the chalkboard, Nothing like that. It is simply saying we need to understand the value of a student's religious background. So often right now in public schools, they either feel like, oh, we can't do anything. We can't allow it. We can't uh, affirm it. Uh, and, and so they just keep it out of the, the classroom. And all we're saying is engage students to connect their faith to their learning, affirm that it's a good thing in their lives when they express it, because it's going to help them in their academics, in their college readiness. Any questions so far? I know I'm kind of just going through this uh, pretty fast, but I want to take a pause and just see if there are any questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and then uh, ask me. Uh, so for example, if I'm teaching, I could say something like, um, for those students who have faith in God, um, this would be an example of where this would be, a, this would support your faith or something like that, or? Yeah, what, what some, I, some ways that I would recommend, for instance, um, if you're coming, to, uh, dealing with decision-making, um, you can say, I know many of you come from families of faith. And uh, so in your decision-making, uh, make sure you're filtering it through your family's beliefs about your religious, uh, your faith. Uh, or uh, if you're teaching about somebody who is religious or, you know, Martin Luther King, for instance, Reverend Martin Luther King, and you're teaching about Black History Month and, and some of the things he talked about, you can teach by attribution and say, uh, you know, for Dr. King, here's why this was so important. The, his religious faith really motivated and animated him to do this and seek justice and so forth. Uh, so you can teach by attribution, attributing it to the source, but you can also just often the simple transition is to say, I know many of you come from families of faith. And we're going to get into uh, students' religious freedoms and what can be expressed in the classroom. And when you know that, you can do that for patriotic exercises. You can do it for a civics lesson. You can do it as a back to school night. I know a first grader, a first grade uh, teacher who went through our training on students' religious freedoms. And now what she does is at back to school night with the parents there, she just says, I want you to know my classroom is a, a, a welcoming place for your family's religious faith. It'll be affirmed, it'll be welcomed. We want your children to feel like they can be who they are. Uh, and that's a, just a beautiful way of saying that's okay, you know, and uh, 
because we've had too many situations, and I'll tell you about these in a, in a little bit, we've had a lot of situations where teachers shut down student expression because they think that they are like the policemen for separation of church and state, and they have an, a, a wrong view of that to begin with. Any other questions? Okay, then let's proceed. Let's take a look at the legal support. So we see that, yes, academically, it can have a real value to students, but what, is, what does the law really say about it? Well, believe it or not, the Supreme Court has addressed this in a case called Lynch versus Donnelly, in which they referred to this idea of a separation of church and state. And they say the concept of a wall of separation between church and state is a useful metaphor, but is not an accurate description of the practical aspects of the relationship that in fact exists. The Constitution does not require complete separation of church and state. That's a shock to a lot of people to hear the Supreme Court say that. It affirmatively mandates accommodation, not merely tolerance of all religions, and it forbids hostility toward any. Um, anything less would require the callous indifference that was never intended by the Establishment Clause. So. Uh, this idea that separation of church and state is just cast in stone, it really is not. Uh, and one of the things, I'm sorry, this is on a timer, so I'm going to pull back a little bit. One of the things I encourage um, people to do is simply get the word out that separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. It, it is something that we have referred to because of a letter from Jefferson. But I find that Oftentimes, the better way to talk about separation of church and state with people is to simply, well, first of all, point out Supreme Court says it's not an accurate description of the relationship. Secondly, ask yourself, ask them, well, first, you know, I'm not for the Church of America. I'm not suggesting that the clergy have any legislative authority over elected officials. And I don't want elected officials to have any ecclesiastical authority over our clergy. So there, yes, I agree, there should be a separation. But then you can ask them a simple question, practical question. What do you do when a church is on fire? Do we not call the fire department because that would be the state helping a place of worship? Or if a synagogue is vandalized, we don't wanna call the police because that would be the state helping a place of worship? Oh, no, 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 the person will say, no, no, I don't, I don't think that. I'm not, I'm not saying that kind of separation. Oh, okay. Well, what about the fact that our state academic standards expect us to teach about the Bible and Christianity and religious beliefs? Uh, and they're shocked sometimes to hear. Like here in California, the current state academic standards, this is not from 1950, this is right now. The current state academic standards says that students are to note the origins of Christianity and the Jewish messianic prophecies the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth as described in the New Testament and how the Apostle Paul helped define and spread Christian beliefs. So the state academic standards expect it. Courts, as we've seen, support it. Freedom of speech is protected. It's part of our history. It's part of our community. Are, are you saying we should censor all of this out of our history and our community and, and squash free speech? Well, no, 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 I'm not for that. So what I find is when you unpack it, it helps people understand the reasons it's uh, what what separation of church and state really looks like. It's not this hard and fast. Nothing can ever be talked about in public schools uh, because of separation of church and state. But I find that a lot of school administrators shut down conversation about it by just throwing out the term separation of church and state. But when you unpack it, uh, they realize now, OK, it's not quite as clear and, and, and simple as I, I think it is. So understanding that separation of church and state isn't a real thing, that it is uh, not supported by the Supreme Court, and that it has the practical outplaying of that in the community is much more complex than we want to think. I think it's also important that students understand the importance of religious freedom. And your colleagues need to understand this as well. Because so often we say, well, religious freedom is important uh, because it's protected in the First Amendment. No, it's protected in the First Amendment because it's important. Even for people who are not religious, it still has value. And here's how you can talk about that to people. Uh, 
There's a great book, by the way, that I highly recommend from Luke Goodrich named uh, called Free to Believe. He's an attorney with the Beckett Fund for Religious Freedom. Last year, he came out with this wonderful book. It really makes the argument for why religious freedom is so important to a society. And the first thing he points out is it's a benefit to society. It promotes diversity because not everybody has to be the same. It promotes harmony because we realize we all have to get along. And so we allow the others to have freedom just like we. We honor their freedom. They honor our freedom. And then there's tremendous social good that happens in uh, the country because of it. Uh, charities, homeless shelters, feeding the poor, uh, hospitals, all kinds of things that uh, people of faith are motivated by their faith to do. In fact, I saw one study that said that um, something like a trillion dollars a year is contributed to America uh, each year through charitable organizations. I don't mean a trillion dollars in money. I mean a trillion dollars in the goods and services that they provide. So it's a benefit to society, and I think everybody can agree to that. Number two, it puts limits on government because a person's faith is beyond the authority of the government. So it's recognizing there are limits. In fact, if you're a public school teacher and you have your kids say the Pledge of Allegiance, I would encourage you to go through step by step. What does the pledge really mean? What does each phrase mean? And when you get to the phrase, one nation under God, that's not saying a prayer. That's recognizing what the founders understood, that our rights come from God, not the government. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Because uh, if the government gives you your rights, they can take it away. And this is why governments like North Korea and uh, China, they don't want religious freedom because they don't want anybody to say there's something higher than the government that I'm answerable to. And so it puts limits on government, which is very important. And in fact, um, that's why, for instance, back uh, you know, in the day, the Quakers refused to participate in military uh, uh, battles. And they wanted a, um, because of their conscience. And so now we have, the government has accommodated that, not just tolerated it, but accommodated it with, um, conscientious objector laws. And so that's saying there's an area that the government can't force somebody to do something because of their faith. The third thing is it's a basic human right. You know, as human beings, we have the urge for asking questions, the big questions. Why am I here? Uh, what's my purpose? Uh, what's truly good? Uh, what happens when I die? Animals don't ask themselves those questions. And so it's something about being human that has those, those transcendent questions that we seek and religious uh, answers play a big part of that. And so it's really, if, if you're taking away somebody's religious freedom, you're really treating them less than human and, and saying that's not something that you have a right to. But we do because inherently all around the world, people are looking for those transcendent answers to their questions. So those are three important reasons why religious freedom is so important. And it's not just a matter of, we don't want teachers just to go, well, okay, because the law says they have the freedom to uh, talk about their faith, I'll allow it. We want teachers to say, no, this is a good thing. Religious freedom is important to society. And it's really good for the student because it helps them connect their faith to their learning. And that's gonna motivate them in more ways here in the classroom. Any questions so far about that? This is so good. I'm answering all your questions. This is really great. Eric, let me just, um, Yvette had asked if the reason that the church separation of church and state originated from the situation that happened in England so that our country wouldn't have to have one religion for everyone to, to live by. I believe that in general that is correct, but can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I'll give you a little bit of a history on it. Um, the Danbury Baptists in Connecticut, uh, they wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson. The Baptists at that time were a minority denomination. The majority denomination in, in Connecticut was uh, Congregationalists. And while uh, the First Amendment said that Congress shall make no law establishing religion, there were still state religions. And uh, the Congregational Church was the state religion of Connecticut. And so, the Danbury Baptist wrote to Jefferson 
recognizing he had no authority, but they were just expressing their concern. Uh, he had no authority over Connecticut and what they were doing. But they said, Our, the religious freedoms we have are uh, privileges granted rather than inalienable rights. And that was true. And so Jefferson was pointing out, he said, well, I, I believe there should be a wall of separation. And it wasn't to protect the state from the church. It was to protect the church from the state. In this particular situation, it was to protect the Danbury Baptists from the state of Connecticut. And so he was saying, I think there should be a wall. But again, it's just simply a metaphor. And yes, religious freedom has been a, an evolving sort of... Um, uh, doctrine, so to speak. Um, you know, it, it hasn't always been around, but uh, it really has its roots in, in Christian history, because, for instance, the Christians in the Roman Empire had to, to uh, advocate for religious freedom so that they could uh, worship freely. And then, of course, you had the problems with all the, the religious wars in Europe, and you had the, uh, the, the pilgrims coming to America, to escape some of that. But then, of course, they had the challenge of we're trying to start a, a, uh, a covenantal sort of government here around our religious beliefs. But then people started coming in from other religions or other versions of Christianity, and that was causing problems. So yes, over time, this began to develop where we saw the need for accommodation and living together and having the religious freedoms that we have. But uh, it wasn't just, you know, Jefferson used that phrase and then everybody picked up on it and said, ah, see, there needs to be a separation. But he wasn't really referring to keeping religious ideas and people out of government. He was talking about government keeping its nose out of uh, the church and religious people. In fact, I like one of the things that, that uh, Reverend Martin Luther King said. He said that the religion is not, or the church, he said, the church is not the master nor the servant of the state. It is the conscience of the state. I thought that was a great, great uh, way to look at it. Let's take a look at uh, students uh, and educators' religious liberties. And I want to drill down on this and, and spend some time because this is a really practical application of how does religion work out in the public square, particularly in the public school environment. And last year, uh, the U.S. Department of Education issued new guidance on students' religious liberties. And so we're going to drill down on that specifically so that everybody understands it. It's really important that we get wide distribution to this information. If you go to ed.gov and look up guidance on constitutionally protected prayer and religious expression in public elementary and secondary schools, you can get the entire document. We're going to go through some of the key application parts of that. Uh, and show you some of the quotations. I highlighted there that the words religious expression because that was new. They added that in. We had uh, done some lobbying over the last three years to get the Department of Education to update and reissue its guidance. It hadn't been done in about 16 years. The guidance has been around since 1995, but it needed to be updated. And uh, so one of the things we asked them to do was expand it to more than just prayer and talk about religious expression. We were delighted to see that they did that. So uh, first of all, the, um, let's see, there we go. Students may express their beliefs about religion in homework, artwork, and other written and oral assignments, free from discrimination based on the religious perspective of their submissions. It used to say religious content of their submissions, but I like the use of the term perspectives. Because in today's world, unfortunately, certain perspectives are considered bigoted, hateful, so forth. And uh, so I appreciate that they put that in there as a nuanced word. But basically saying, look, the way that the federal government looks at it is uh, free of speech. Um, you can speak to whomever you want to about whatever you want to, including your faith. And so if it's relevant to the assignment, the student can talk about their faith, talk about what it means to them, express it in their homework or class discussions or oral presentations. Had a case, you know, out here in California, we have a lot of uh, brush fires. And 
uh, had a situation where it was a high school English class for seniors. And the, uh, the assignment was write about how you felt as you watched this brush fire on TV that happened to be near their community. And a passionate Christian girl wrote about how it reminded her of that Bible verse that God is a consuming fire. And she wrote about her burning passion for Christ. And the teacher refused to even grade the paper because she dared to mention God. And uh, it took a meeting between the parent and the teacher and the school principal and the student before the teacher tearfully said, okay, uh, I'll allow it this time, but now I've got to change all my assignments so this never happens again. It's like, what? So, I mean, a, a student took you up on the assignment, write how you felt as you watched these fires. So she wrote about how she felt, but because you didn't like it because she mentioned God, you think you can censor that. But that's, that's the problem when they don't understand that, no, the federal guidance, the federal laws support a teacher or a student in expressing their faith as it's appropriate to the assignment. Tell you about another case though, here in California. This is where a teacher went through our training and we do, we do an online training for teachers on all the things you can do in a public school. And she knew that, that uh, this is little Olivia. The assignment was do an oral report on a hero and Olivia chose Jesus. And so the students were supposed to dress up like their hero and talk about their hero. And so she was able to do her report on Jesus. And the reason that Shirley, her teacher, felt free to let her do that was because she realized, no, no, this is her freedom of expression. She can do this, it's in keeping with the assignment. Another thing in prayer, uh, students can, uh, Pray when not engaged in school activities or instruction, subject to the same rules designed to prevent material disruption of the educational program that are applied to other privately initiated expressive activities. So in other words, if you have free time, if, hey, you're done with the lesson, you got a few minutes before the bell rings for the next class, uh, and you just say, hey, you know, talk quietly among yourself, and a couple of students want to pray over something, that's totally up to them. Again, the federal government looks at it as freedom of expression. You can talk to whomever you want to, including your maker, and you don't get in the way of that. Now, if they're supposed to be working on an assignment and they say, no, we wanna huddle over here and pray. Well, wait a second, no, you're supposed to be working on the assignment. Uh, so it's a matter of material disruption in how you would normally have regular conversations with one another. Also means you can pray over your meals, uh, you can pray during recess, free time, and all those sorts of things as well. Uh, reading religious books. Among other things, students may read their books, their Bibles, Torahs, Korans, or other scriptures, say grace before meals, and pray or study religious materials with fellow students during recess, the lunch hour, or other non-instructional time to the same extent that they may engage in other non-religious activities. So again, if you have a free reading time and a student wants to bring their Bible, Torah, Quran, and, and read during that free reading time, or maybe a devotional book or something like that, uh, as long as it's free reading time, then it's free reading. They, they are free to read whatever they'd like. Uh, so they can pray over their meals and they can study religious materials if they want. Um, so non-instructional time is the key there. The new, what's new and added is it used to just say Bibles, now it says Torahs and Korans. Students may pray with fellow students during the school day on the same terms and conditions they may engage in other conversations or speech. Students may also speak to and attempt to persuade their peers about religious topics, just as they do with regard to political topics. And again, that phrase, attempt to persuade, was uh, included as new. In, in our own family's experience, we have three daughters, and uh, I remember in elementary school, one of our daughters was sharing the gospel with a classmate out on the playground, and a playground supervisor came up to her and said, Katie, you can't talk about that. And uh, so she didn't. Then she came home and told her dad, and then I had a really nice conversation about that, and that was all corrected. But you do it in a gracious way. We, we call it relational activism. You know, you don't go with the torch and the pitchfork. You just help somebody understand what the law really says. 
This is a whole new section on distribution of religious literature. Students have a right to distribute religious literature to their schoolmates on the same terms as they are permitted to distribute other literature that is unrelated to school curriculum or activities. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that a student can just stand in the hall and pass out tracts or something like that or pass out Bibles. If the, if the school has a policy that says you have to have permission if you're going to do some mass distribution of something, then they'd have to get permission for this as well. But if it means you want to give a Christmas card to a classmate or you want to give uh, a candy cane that has a scripture on it or something for Christmas, that the school should not get in the way of that. If the same way that you can give them a, a birthday invitation or you can pass a note to a, a classmate or share a magazine or a cartoon or something with a classmate, they're not to get in the way of it just because it has a religious message to it. So they're permitted to distribute that in an equal basis. Eric, can I ask a question about sure. that? If, um, in my understanding, correct me, is it if a school said, hey, nobody can hand out anything without approval, then, you know, then they couldn't do that, right? But they could try to get approval. But the school, if it's going to allow approval of a flyer for a soccer club, should also then equally provide approval. Like, is there a kind of an, yes. everybody's under the same rule, right? That's the idea, is treat it equally, not discriminated against because of the content of what it's going to say, and, and unless it's obscene and, you know, defamatory and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Clothing with religious messages. This was new. Schools may enjoy substantial discretion in adopting policies relating to student dress and school uniforms. Schools, however, may not single out religious attire in general or attire of a particular religion for prohibition or regulation. So if you can have messages, other messages, then you could wear a t-shirt with a, a message about your faith. This came up actually in, um, I think it was Mississippi or Missouri, just a few couple of months ago regarding a child, a third grader who was, they all had to wear masks and they were allowed to have messages on their masks. And so they had, you know, both uh, social messages as well as uh, their favorite sports teams and that sort of thing. And so one little girl put a, a message on her mask that said, Jesus loves me. And it was just about her. It wasn't about Jesus loves you, but that'd still be okay. But it was Jesus loves me. The principal made her take it off and said, no, you can't, you can't wear that. And when the mom complained and said, wait a second, you allow other messages, so why are you singling this one out? They actually went back retroactively and changed the, the, uh, the regulation to say, you can't wear religious messages. Well, that goes ex against exactly what the Department of Education said. You cannot single out um, a religious message on a piece of clothing. And so uh, they are being contacted by uh, a legal organization to let them know that actually, no, they're violating the students' uh, freedom of religious expression. Uh, see you at the poll, those kinds of prayer gatherings. Students may organize prayer groups and religious clubs and see you at the poll gatherings before school to the same extent that students are permitted to organize other non-curricular student activities, uh, activity groups. So. Uh, again, a lot of uh, students participate in a see you at the poll event, and uh, if they're allowed to also meet before school for anything else, then they can't be denied that just because they're going to be praying. And in my opinion, if you're going to have high school or junior high students want to pray together, who would want to discourage that? I mean, my goodness, that's, that can only be a positive thing. Whether you're a believer or not, to have students gather and take their religious faith seriously, I think that's important. And to clarify on that, a teacher, uh, talk, talk about the teacher's role, if you would, in that. It's best, I recommend that teachers not participate, uh, that they stand, if they want to be supportive, they stand back, they don't actually engage in the prayer, they stand back to be supportive. However, technically, if they wanted to, if it is before contract time, um, then you're okay. Uh, it's when you're on the clock, you're recognized as a teacher. And uh, in fact, you might even say to the students, I'm here as uh, Mr. Smith, I'm not here as your teacher. If it's before school and you're not on the clock. 
Uh, it says such groups must be given the same access to school facilities for assembling as given to other non-curricular groups without discrimination because of the religious perspective of their, their expression. Now let's take a look at some of the religious freedoms of uh, teachers because the guidance goes into that as well and it's important for you to understand it. When acting in their official capacities as representatives of the state, teachers, school administrators, and other school personnel are prohibited by the First Amendment from encouraging or discouraging prayer and from actively participating in such activity with students. However, teachers may take part in religious activities where the overall context makes clear that they're not participating in their official capacities. So obviously, if you're off the clock, um, that's when it really seems, and that's when you're clearly on your own. Uh, in fact, the courts have said, even if you're, if you're leading a religious club on campus, but you're doing it after your contract time, uh, you're free to do that. And so uh, that's, the, that's the key for teachers is contract time. Teachers may also uh, take part in religious activities such as prayer, even during their workday at a time when it is permissible to engage in other private conduct, such as making a personal telephone call. Before school or during lunch, for example, teachers may meet with other teachers for prayer or Bible study to the same extent that they may engage in other conversation or non-religious activities. Similarly, teachers may participate in their personal capacity in privately sponsored baccalaureate ceremonies or similar events. Again, if you attend a baccalaureate service and you're gonna be one of the speakers or you wanna open in prayer, uh, you're not there on contract time. Uh, you're there as a citizen and it's perfectly fine for you to do that. Uh, and again, if you are in the lunch, uh, you know, lunch lounge and you're talking, uh, the teacher's lounge and you're talking about your faith, uh, you can do that in the same way you talk about your favorite sports team you want to talk about who won the game on Sunday, you can talk about what you learned in church on Sunday. Those are private conversations by consenting adults. And so uh, that is perfectly acceptable to do. Now, they also added new uh, information on teaching about religion. And this is helpful because a lot of times people are hesitant to teach about religion because uh, again, the, the flawed view of the separation of church and state. But there it says public schools may not provide religious instruction, but they may teach about religion. And when they say provide religious instruction, they mean it's not Sunday school, it's not catechism. Uh, you're not proselytizing, but you're teaching about the religion. For example, philosophical questions concerning religion, the history of religion, comparative religion, the Bible or other religious teachings as literature, and the role of religion in the history of the United States and other countries are all permissible public school subjects. And so you should not hesitate. If you're gonna be teaching uh, something that has relevant uh, significance to the academic topic and it's religious in nature, you can teach all about that. Again, I recommend that you do that by what we call attribution. This person in history, here's what he believed or she believed, and this is what motivated them to do what they did. And uh, that is a, a great arm's length way of, of addressing the topic. Goes on to say, uh, similarly, it is permissible to consider religious influences on philosophy, art, music, literature, and social studies. And in our webinar that we do for communities, um, we have a whole section on inclusion strategies where we say, how does this work in my classroom? And we go across the curriculum and up and down the grade levels, and we talk about different ideas for how to appropriately teach about the Bible and Christianity as it relates to your academic topic and do it all within constitutional boundaries. Eric, we have a question. Caroline has a question. Sure. And actually, I'm sorry, Eric, it has to do with the slide that you were talking about before this one. This one. With um, attribution. Yeah. So I'm a first grade teacher in Sunnyside and during, um, before the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday in January, one of the things that, um, I did was I took our state standards for the writing, which was research, which was perfect, 
researching about a person. So I was still using the standards, but instead of doing our regular unit from the curriculum, I put it um, about Martin Luther King Jr. because I wanted the kids to understand why they weren't coming to school mm -hmm. on the, that next Monday. And so I kind of, I took a little liberty with that. I talked about Rosa Parks. I talked about um, Ruby Bridges because when she was in first grade, that was when um, they started uh, desegregation and she, she was one of the first little girls to um, attend an all white school. This was in New Orleans actually at the time. And so there's literature um, that I felt was important sharing about the time, like sharing things about Martin, uh, that he was a pastor, that he did believe in God, that mm -hmm. he he prayed and he did these things. Yeah. Um, and one of the books that I shared about Ruby Bridges was that she stopped and she prayed for the mob of angry people yelling at her. Um, so was, was that okay? Like, was I justified in doing that? If parents would have complained and said, which they did not, but if, if I would have had a parent that would have said, I'm not comfortable with my kid listening to this, or, you know, am, am I justified in, in making the argument that it still fits with the standards? I mean, I don't want to sidestep anything, but at the, the same time, I also want clarification. Because yeah. This is a project that is dear, near and dear to my heart, and I feel like it's important to talk yeah. about, especially with our current social climate. Yeah, and, and it's absolutely acceptable to do that. Um, you, Martin Luther King's religious faith was significant to, uh, obviously, for, for what he did. And if you read his writings, I mean, it just throughout his I Have a Dream speech, he quotes Isaiah 40. And his uh, letter from a Birmingham jail, you could make a Bible study out of it. He starts out with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, goes on through scripture, and he ends up talking about three men died on Calvary Hill, three for immorality and one for truth and justice and love. And so to explain the context, in order to understand Martin Luther King Jr., you've got to understand the Bible and the references that he uses. And if you go to our website, we have some articles on that. Uh, Martin and Jesus. We have a, a, an article on his um, his uh, Christian pledge. He actually made uh, his people who were protesting his uh, uh, who was participating in his protests had to take a pledge that they would pray for those that opposed them, that they would act like Jesus in their encounters with them, and very few people know that. And so this is all part of understanding who he was and what motivated him and uh, getting that perspective on the era. So absolutely, as it's appropriate to the grade level, you know, you can't go too right. sophisticated with first graders, but as appropriate to the grade level, you're-, you're Well, because good. Ruby was in first grade when all of this happened, yeah. and I mean, hardly anybody even knows who she is. Yeah. And so I really feel like, wow, Here's this young woman. She's, I mean, an older woman now, but you know, there's a Norman Rockwell picture of her, and I got to show the kids the picture of her, and they got to hear her own words. They got to hear um, her teacher yeah. speak um, about what it was like and how scary it was for her teacher to show up to school in the morning with these angry mobs and federal marshals taking her to school, and so, you know. I, I wanted to just share like with Ruby, just her, her heart that she just loved learning and yeah. she loved being in school. And so the kids, you know, were able to kind of make those connections. And I think it really resonated with them because they are exactly the same age as she was. Yeah. She was and, experiencing it. And here's what you do if somebody objects and says, oh, why are you mentioning the religious aspect of her life and that sort of thing? Then just ask the question back so you'd like me to censor that because i find people go wait wait set no i'm not for censorship what <laughs> well you want me to censor that part of her life right um and so when they see that that's what's happening here then and, you know if you're and you're saying look i'm not 
I'm not telling the kids they need to love Jesus. They need to believe in God. I'm telling them about this person and, and the graciousness of this person, that sort of thing, you know? So yeah, just, it's oftentimes how you put it, but um, if you can tie it to the academics, then, then you're solid. Yeah. And Eric, there was two other um, questions um, while we're on some questions real quick. How do you address those people that say seeing someone read any religious book makes them feel uncomfortable? What's a good way to do that? And then I'll get to the second question. Read a religious book? Yeah, like if it's, if it's okay, but the a teacher administrator says, I just feel uncomfortable with students reading the religious books. I just want to stay away from all of that. Like they're not singling out a religion. They just yeah, don't I would just say, welcome to America. They have the freedom to do it. And I'm sorry you feel uncomfortable about it. Maybe you should uh, think about why you feel uncomfortable about allowing a student to actually express their uh, religious faith by reading a, their religious book, uh, because that's the law. And if he were to restrict that, he could get sued. Mm. And uh, I know one thing I know about school administrators, they just don't want trouble. And so I find that when you point out to them, uh, while you may not like it, if you try to restrict it, you are opening yourself up to a slam dunk lawsuit. Uh, and I don't think you want to do that. So. Okay, perfect. And then uh, Bernadette asks, can you further clarify the difference between religious instruction, like uh, devotional and teaching about religion? I think you answered a little bit of that with Caroline, but any other yeah. thing you want to wrap up that? Well, again, I, the idea of uh, attribution, teaching by attribution, here's what Martin Luther believed. Here's what, uh, this is what motivated this group, or here's why Christians believe this. I had a teacher once, um, we, we have some material on how to teach about the holidays, how to teach about Easter. And uh, so she had the kids learning all about Easter and the, the resurrection of Christ and um, had them doing an art project uh, expressing that. And, and then one of her students said, Mrs. So-and-so, did this really happen? And she said, yes. And that would be the one area I would have coached her to say, no, what you want to say is that is why this is so important to Christians, because the Bible tells them that this is what happened. You're attributing it to the Christians. Now, I, this is not to get into the apologetics argument of did the resurrection happen or didn't it happen, but that's a, it's a matter of faith. And so you want to attribute it to the source and say, well, this is what the Bible story is, and this is what, what Christians believe, and this is why they celebrate this holiday. Um, so instead of saying, yes, and you too should have Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that's a bridge too far. You don't want to go there. So what if students, I'm sorry to interrupt. What if students directly ask, ask the teacher, what do you believe? Yeah, that's a good question. Often we get asked that. And, mm -hmm. and my answer is be honest and be brief. So if they say, Hey, do you, do you believe this happened? Yes, I'm a Christian. It's important to me. And I celebrate Easter or whatever it might be you're talking about. And then move on. Don't say, well, I'm glad you asked. Now let me share how you too can have a relationship with Jesus. That doesn't mean now they've opened the door so you can just say anything you want. So be honest, but be brief. Uh, the idea, you can tell them who you are and what's important to you and then move on. Yeah. Does that help? Or, oh, uh, sorry. Did right. that answer the question? Yeah. Oh, did that answer for you? Luke? Okay. He says yes. Um, uh, in the chat, Kim says um, to, to use the help me understand approach when confronting the teacher. Um, can you uh, maybe just explain how you would, I, you know, how would you say that if a teacher was, I think going back to maybe the religious books. This, this is the value of having your wife listening in on this conversation. Kim is my wife and she is reminding me uh, about this technique. Yes, one of the things we do is we recommend that if you're a parent talking to a teacher about a concern like this, or if they're restricting a student from uh, doing something that is legal for them to do, then you start with, help me understand. Uh, just you really want to understand where the teacher's coming from. Help me understand if the teacher says, well, I just think we need to really be careful about religion and you know, we don't want that to alienate students in the classroom. Then step number two is find a, a common ground and say, you know, I, 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 I think it's wonderful that you really want a classroom to be a welcoming and safe environment where everybody feels included. That's great. So you're finding this common ground, but then you you make your point by simply then saying, but have you considered? And then when you, you say, but have you considered that 
actually the student has the freedom to express their faith as it's appropriate to the assignment. And you're actually then squelching that student's uh, what's important to them and uh, their faith and their life. And, and by the way, it's the law. Students have the right to express their faith in class as it's appropriate. So, and then you could say, you know, I think you might find this helpful and actually give them the Department of Education's guidance. We found that when parents take that approach of help me understand, finding common ground to agree on, and then, but have you considered, and you move them in the direction you want them to understand, the teachers oftentimes come back thanking you because they didn't realize this. They were doing something based on a false assumption and they're appreciative of it. We had a case like that come up regarding the a pledge to mother earth. We had a, a parent contact us and say, okay, what do I do here? I've got, um, the kids are saying a pledge to the flag and then afterward they're doing a pledge to mother earth. And so she, how, do I, how do I address that? I said, okay, well, first we start with the teacher. You don't go to the principal. You always start with the teacher. And I taught her the help me understand technique over the phone. Help me understand why you're having the kids say a pledge to Mother Earth. You know, we never did that when we were in school. And really wanting to understand. You're not asking it rhetorically. You're asking to really understand. And then the, the teacher said, well, you know, we're, we're learning about the environment and ecology and not littering and that sort of thing. And I was at a teacher's conference and I, I saw this pledge and I thought, oh, that, that would really help drive home the point about being conscious of your environment. And the teacher said, oh, okay, well, you know, I really appreciate that you want the kids to be aware of their environment, not litter and really have that ingrained in them. That's, that's wonderful. I totally agree with that. But have you considered you're actually teaching a spiritual belief because there's a whole group of, of people who believe, and this was, by the way, in New Mexico and a very uh, new agey sort of environment. Uh, there's a whole group of people who believe that, that the earth is a spirit, the Gaia, and it, can, and it can hear us and it appreciates the pledges that we give to it and that sort of thing. Uh, the teacher was shocked. She, oh, no, I had no idea. I don't, I don't want to teach that. And so by the end of the conversation, the teacher was thanking the mom for alerting her to something that could be a potentially embarrassing problem. Uh, so that's the kind of relational approach that you can take to help somebody understand when there's a concern that, uh, that they, don't, uh, they don't know what's going on. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move on here then. It also says, although public schools may teach about religious holidays, including their religious aspects and may celebrate the secular aspects of the holiday, schools may not observe holidays as religious events or promote observance by uh, such observance by students. So there's no problem teaching about a religious holiday. Uh, for instance, Christmas is coming up or well, we've got Easter coming up. So let's, let's think about that. Uh, it's important for students to understand our culture, to understand what are people celebrating with Easter? Well, here's what Christians believe. And then you can explain the story, uh, death and resurrection of Christ. And we have, in fact, uh, on, the, on our uh, webinars, we have a downloadable uh, lesson that you can give to students that's actually Luke 2 through 24, uh, 22 through 24, explaining, uh, it's, it's our paraphrase of, the death and resurrection of Christ. And then we connect it to various historical settings and phrases that we use in our culture and that sort of thing. And so to help students understand this person who had such an impact on history and why so many people around the world uh, honor that in a celebration called Easter, you can teach all about it. So you're teaching about the holiday, but you're not teaching it as a religious event or exercise for them to be a part of. Uh, you can celebrate the secular aspects of it, so candy, Easter bunnies, flowers, that sort of thing, but you're not trying to observe it like a religious holiday. Um, and so it's important that, that you recognize it, affirm the students uh, who that's important to them. You want all students to understand it. And I, I recommend that you, for instance, with Christmas, when you have Christmas parties and that sort of thing, you're not talking about Christmas celebration, you're talking about 
uh, acknowledging the holiday. There's a difference between acknowledging and celebrating. Not everybody celebrates Christmas. You've got Jewish students in your classroom. They're not celebrating Christmas. They can certainly acknowledge Christmas, learn about it, um, but they're not celebrating. So it's just a little bit of how you talk about it. So when can you tell your students about religious freedom? Well, I encourage you to, uh, to do that at the beginning of the school year. Uh, when you're talking about classroom decorum, rules and that sort of thing, hey, I also want you to know my classroom is a welcoming place for you to express your religious faith. I know many of you come from families of faith and as it's relevant to the assignment, relevant to discussions, feel free to be who you are and, and express that. Maybe during patriotic observances, when we're learning about the Constitution and the First Amendment, when we're learning about the Declaration of Independence and what did they mean when they said, uh, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Okay, you can talk about all of that. Or as part of a civics lesson, hey, here's what the First Amendment says. Here's how that applies in your school, in our classroom. Or as a character education, part of an er character education program, uh, you know, we're, we're all wanting to be kind. Okay, we have the character lesson on kind, kindness. But uh, why should we be kind? Well, you may be motivated by your religious faith. I know many of you believe, for instance, that you should treat others the way you would want to be treated or love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and if that comes from your religious background, I want you to think about that. And that should be a part of who you are. So I want you to feel that you can include that when you write about why this character quality is important to you in your journal today or something like that. So just different ways that you can let students know they're free to be who they are different ways to do that. So any questions? We're almost uh, going to be wrapping up. Got a few more minutes, a few more things to go here, but I just wanted to see if you had any questions at this point. We're all good. Eric, this is Paul DeYoung. Yeah. One of, one of the approaches that I'm pondering on is um, to have this, you know, work with our students in our, in our faith communities and encourage them to bring it up, you know, they are the ones who are introducing it. Uh, for example, see what the poll, have a student go to the principal as opposed to say myself go to the principal. Do, yep. you, do you find that to be uh, a lot safer ground and more effective? Well, it can be more effective and it can also be good for the student to actually show some leadership, take initiative. You know, um, I often have said, and I as we raised our kids and, and as I uh, talked to parents, my definition of maturity is somebody who takes the initiative to handle responsibilities well. And so you want students to take the initiative to handle their responsibility of living their Christian faith out loud in, in the world. And this is a great example of how they could do that. And so, yeah, to get them to take the initiative, uh, that's going to be better, student, student led, student initiated. Uh, so, yes. I would recommend that. Thank you. Others? Let me introduce you then, uh, finally here in closing, about a campaign that we have put together to really bring these truths into your local schools. We call it the National Free to Speak Campaign. The idea is to promote religious freedom for all students and to minister to the body of Christ on campus. You know, one of our operating assumptions as an organization is there are Christians throughout the public school system, uh, not only students and parents, but teachers, administrators, school board members, superintendents, they're all throughout the system. But oftentimes they don't know what they can do. And so they, they don't do much. Uh, and so we, as I like to say, we help set the captives free because they're bound up in their misconceptions and, and uh, lack of information about what they can do and how to do it appropriately. And so we want them working together. Campus ministries that are working in those schools, whether it's good news clubs for elementary schools after school, or whether it's fellowship of Christian athletes for high school students, we want the body of Christ to work together on a campus. And so the National Free to Speak campaign is working in five key areas. I want to explain this to you because I'd love to bring this into your community and really help you minister to the body of Christ on your campuses. First of all, we work with churches. 
Uh, obviously, that's where the body of Christ is uh, most assembled on Sundays, but we want to help minister Monday through Friday to that same group of people as they're out in the community and specifically in schools. So we provide materials they can distribute. We're working on an app that will deal with the free to speak campaign and get that out so everybody has it on their iPhone. We want it to uh, engage people. One of the first things we do when we say, okay, you want to reach your campus? We're going to sit down and actually map out your schools and where is the body of Christ in your schools? Uh, and you start brainstorming on who are the Christians that we know already? Maybe there's a board member, a superintendent, a school administrator. You start working together and you figure out where, where are our fellow brothers and sisters that we can begin to minister to? And you actually literally map out your, your, your body of Christ on your schools. Uh, the second thing is we provide a live webinar uh, for parents and for uh, educators. And the nice thing about doing this, we used to do them in person, of course, before COVID. The nice thing of doing about it uh, virtually is that you're going to get broader participation. And we, you know, educators, when we would do it for educators, the educator seminar, they, of course, didn't feel as comfortable with parents being there because they're sitting at the table learning about all the things they should be doing. Uh, parents looking at them saying, yeah, how come you're not doing this? So uh, we would make it exclusively for educators. But now as a virtual event, parents can join in as well. So now parents are learning all the things that can happen in their schools as well. And then we do uh, keeping the faith, keeping their faith in public schools is a, a webinar for specifically for parents, but of course, grandparents or teachers, anybody can, can join the call. And there we talk about how to navigate the public schools so that your children come out stronger on the other end, not weaker, where they learn how to be discerning about what they're learning, how to have conversations with teachers when there's a concern and that sort of thing. So we give them all the strategies that way. Uh, and we give the educators the resources for how to teach about students' religious freedoms in the classroom. Uh, then we also give teachers all the resources they need on how to teach about the Bible and Christianity and the good that the Bible and Christianity have done for the world. So often, as I like to say, uh, too many times students only learn about Christianity by studying the Crusades, the Inquisitions, and the Salem witch trials. And they don't learn about all the other good things that Christianity and the Bible have brought to uh, the world. And so we show different ways to do that and how to do that appropriately as it aligns with your state's academic standards. So we customize this for your state's academic standards. The other thing is we've teamed up with the Alliance Defending Freedom. If you're not familiar with them, they're an international uh, religious uh, freedom organization. They're based in Scottsdale and they have affiliates all over the country. And they have agreed that when you bring the campaign into your community, you can give us all the names and addresses of the school officials in your community, from administrators, school board members, superintendents. They will send a six page personalized letter to each of those uh, people explaining in a Q&A format, here's, you know, can students do this? Can teachers do that? And then they go through all the case law. It's personalized, it lets them know, that, hey, you know, we care about you and we care about the condition of your schools and the, the, the freedoms that teachers and, parents and students have. And so they, we get that blanketed to all the school administrators. Then we have a model school board policy for school board members. And this is a, a, an easy sell because it's basically saying the Department of Education, the federal government has come out with guidance on students and teachers' religious freedoms. You don't want lawsuits, you don't want problems, just adopt a policy that aligns with the Department of Education's guidance. This is not a policy about promoting Christianity or anything like that. It's strictly about broad religious freedoms on your campuses, but it brings clarity. And one of the things in the policy is that annually, that information will be distributed to parents, staff, and students so that everybody understands this. Because as you know, I travel the country and I, I always ask teachers, hey, have you ever heard of the guidance from the Department of Education? Because it's been around since 1995. And uh, boy, it's just crickets in the room. They've never heard of it. And so we want to make sure that schools are distributing this information each year so that everybody understands it. And then finally, campus ministries. You've got campus ministries already there, whether it's for the elementary students or the junior high or high school students. And we, we don't want them just to be silos of excellence. We want to help them be more fulfilling. And so when we do a live presentation in your community, our live webinars, 
then we highlight the ministries that are already there working and saying, hey, if you're not already connected with them and supportive of them and engaged with them, we want you to be. And we will do shout outs to them. We will give links to their materials and we want people to get engaged with them because we want those students in those campus ministries when they understand their religious freedoms, then we also have a program where it's a 30 day live your, live your faith out loud on campus. So now that you know what your religious freedoms are, what can you do the, the next 30 days to maybe it's included in a homework assignment, an art project, share the gospel with a friend, an oral presentation, maybe just during a class discussion, you bring up some point that intersects with your faith that's relevant to the academic topic or the discussion on hand. And so they take this challenge and then they survey the students every week to see, hey, has anybody done anything? And they share testimonies of what they've done. And then at the end of the 30 days, we survey the youth leader and say, have you been able to move the needle from doing nothing to doing something in the schools? And imagine if, you know, somebody's in this campus club and they're being given this challenge. And then they go to Mrs. Smith's history class and she gives a civics lesson on students' religious freedoms and says, hey, I just want you to know you're welcome to include your faith in your work here as it's, it's appropriate to the subject matter. All of a sudden, Johnny's going to say, wait a second. Uh, you mean I can do this and I won't get in trouble? Okay, I'm going to do it. And so we want the body of Christ working together on that campus. And so this campaign uh, we can bring into your community. And we're looking for, for people who we're calling advocates. And if you want to be an advocate for this in your community, please give our, our toll-free number a call and just say, hey, I participated in this uh, webinar that Eric put together and um, would love to find out more about becoming an advocate. We have materials we can send you on that. We have somebody here uh, on our team who is focused on coaching advocates on how to bring this into their communities. Uh, but it's a great way to really saturate public schools with religious freedom and then specifically helping the Christians who are on those campuses to be an influence where they are. So uh, with that, I am going to close up and pass it back to Robin, but thank you so much. And again, I encourage you to, uh, to utilize the religious freedoms that students have, that teachers have, because it is an academic asset. It is a behavioral asset. It is addressing what we call the whole and whole child education. The spiritual whole is not being addressed, but is so important to schools and schools will benefit and students will benefit because of it. All right. Yeah, thank you, Eric. I think that was great. I learned so much. And I also wanted to say there was one question that um, you, you addressed a little bit, but um, somebody was saying if they're a substitute teacher, so you know all this, let's say you get all this down, but you come in and you don't have that relationship which sometimes can be the, the flag, the red flag thing. How would you um, suggest that a substitute teacher, if they want, if it was around a holiday, there was a legitimate, you know, something that was a fairly easy segue. How, how might you yeah. address they deal with that? Well, you know, a lot of times for substitutes, um, you're given very specific things you're supposed to be doing and giving this test, monitoring this, teaching about this. And so you might not have the leeway um, on the other hand, sometimes you're in a situation where you've got free reign to kind of, uh, you know, got a few things to look over, but the rest of it is up to you. And as it is appropriate, if you can connect it to the academics, if you can connect it to something that's appropriate for the learning environment, then feel free to do that. Uh, again, you know, here I, I use the analogy of speed limits. If the speed limit is 65 miles an hour on your roads, then I'm not asking you to go 80. I'm not even asking you to go 66, go 65. But as I tell teachers, you know, some of you are going 30 and some of you are even afraid to get on the freeway because you don't know what you can and can't do. And so all I'm trying to do is say, you have the laws, you have the academic standards, you have that freedom. Make sure that you're staying within the limits that you're not pushing it and, and focus on things that are substantive rather than symbolic. Uh, give you an example. Heard a teacher once talking about how when all of her, when any of her students answer a question correctly in class, she says, hallelujah. And the reason she does that is because she knows that one day they're going to ask her, what does hallelujah mean? And then she'll have a chance to share with them about her faith. 
It's like, okay, that's interesting, but what does that have to do with your academic subject you're teaching? Why don't you teach, you know, if you're, if you're teaching English, teach about how the Bible and Christianity has had an influence on literature. If you're studying civics, talk about it in civics and so forth. So there are ways you can do it. Um, you know, if you're having all the kids say the Pledge of Allegiance, teach them why we say one nation under God and what that, how important that was to the founders to understand that God gave us our rights, not the government. So we sometimes think very Christianly. And so as a substitute teacher, you may think, well, I, you know, I'm going to just leave some tracks here for the student. or I'm going to bring my Bible and put it on the desk or, you know, I'll figure out if I can pray with this student. No, keep it academic, keep it professional and figure out a way that's appropriate to the season, to the academics that you could talk about that. But um, yeah, and that's, you know, great answer. I think what we should all do. All right. Uh, is there other questions? <laughs> I like some of your, your uh, speed analogy. Someone said in the chat, um, yeah, I'm close to zero on the freeway because of my concern. And, and Eric, my guess is you probably find my experience with Christian educators is they're closer to zero than they are to 75. The yes. Christian, you know, the rest of the world seems to be closer to 75, like, ah, ah, ah. But I find that Christians don't take the liberties they have it's more yeah. often than not. Yeah, that's true. They're overly cautious. They assume that uh, what they're doing is either inappropriate or they'll get in trouble for it. And so when you're doing something that aligns with your state's academic standards, for instance, you know, here in California, as I mentioned earlier, it, the standard actually says that students are to read the Bible. In the seventh grade, there's actually uh, a statement about um, through reading biblical literature, students will learn about the life and teachings of Jesus. Okay, so they're supposed to read biblical literature. I would say to teachers, don't photocopy your Bible and hand it out to students. Get a Word document, cut and paste from an online Bible, put it into a Word document. At the bottom, put that standard so that when that goes home and somebody says, what in the world are they reading the Bible for? Oh, I see. It says right here, through reading biblical literature. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So you're always making the case for why you're doing what you're doing. Good point. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, that says, okay, I'll stop making my copies. Just kidding. <laughs> doing that, but, but I think this, uh, it sounds like from the chat, a lot of people have um, really thanked you, Eric, for sharing your experience, um, for being able to have this information, as we said to everybody on probably by Monday, we'll have the recording what'll, that'll be available for two weeks uh, so that you can get this information. Eric, is that something you would feel comfortable with them sharing with other teacher friends or um, people oh, sure. they know within that two week? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. And then the PDF will be in there. So you'll be able to have actually some of the, the word. And, and I can't speak highly enough to the Gateways to Better Education. Their website has great resources. Uh, there's a lot of you know free and wonderful resources. There's some resources. I remember when my kiddos were little, um, Eric, I don't know if, but there was these handouts that you would have around Christmas or Thanksgiving, and I could buy that and tell my teacher, Merry Christmas. And it said, here's some great ways that you can yeah. legally teach this. Now, now I knew that not all the teachers maybe were um, Christian, but I, I, I felt like they were faith friendly enough. If I hand that to somebody who is really anti-faith, they're, they're probably just throw it away. But if somebody is interested, like that same zero, yeah. they would be kind of looking at that. Another yeah, thing I would encourage, that's, right? That's is our, just mm -hmm. That's our holiday restoration campaign. And mm -hmm. it's about Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter. And we designed these holiday cards. They're little booklets, but they look like a Christmas card or an Easter card. You give it to the teacher and just say, hey, you know, I thought you'd find this interesting. And then they read it and you circle back with them a few days later and say, what'd you think of that? And you start a conversation and you'll either find they go, oh, this was great. Thanks so much. I've been wondering what I could do about this. Or you'll find them saying, you know, well, I'm not sure that's it's nice, but I don't feel comfortable. Then you simply as a parent, you say, well, could I come in and share what the holiday means to our family? You know, I'm not going to proselytize. I just want to, you know, so the kids understand the holiday. You'll find a lot of teachers will say, yeah, okay. You know, I'm, I'm for diversity and inclusion. Yeah, come on in. I'd like them to learn about that. 
uh, and then you can share what your why, why the holiday is meaningful to you. So uh, that's what we did when our kids were in uh, grade school. I remember in Christmas for Christmas, I was reading. I, I sat down, and they had this, by the way. They had me come in and read to the kids during the winter party, where all the parents were there too for the winter party. And I brought my Bible, and then I brought a children's book of the Luke two story. And I, um, I said to the students, hey, what holiday's coming up? Oh, Christmas. I said, that's great. And, uh, and wh who's Christmas about? Oh, Jesus. They said, you know, some of them said Santa Claus, but Jesus. Okay. And I said, well, here's a book about that that tells the story. But I'm, and, and what's the name of this book? Oh, it's the Bible. And then, but I'm going to read you this children's version. I'm going to read you this. It has pictures. And so. So I started reading all about the birth of Jesus and I got done and I thought, I'm look, when I look up, I'm going to see all these parents all mad at me and like, how dare you do this? And instead I look up and I'm getting, I realized, yeah, I'm thinking I'm the only Christian, or, you know, my wife and I are the only Christians in this classroom, half the class, you know, and, and they're all just going, yay. So sometimes when you step out a little bit and you, you think, oh, nobody's going to be, join me in this. You find no actually a lot of people are really appreciative of it mm -hmm. and you can never underestimate um, the value of relationship right when you are there because it's the often the people who will complain even if it's legal and there's no reason for them to complain when there is that relationship between the teacher and the parents and they understand that and, and between the parents and the administrators and, and all of that so i always um, I think your wife brought up some, some really good things when we're curious about it and help them understand Then we make sure we save the relationship and keep that positive, which in turn helps us to be able to fully realize our freedoms. Yeah, that's right. We call it relational activism. You know, there's a time and a place for politics, obviously. There's a time and a place for legal action if necessary. But what do you do on Monday? It's all about relationships. And God has given us relationships. How do we then speak into those relationships in ways, you know, I often say we're called to be salt and light, but we use salt on things to make it better, not bitter. And our light should be a lamp, not a blowtorch. And so if we keep that in mind and we look at opportunities instead of conflicts, uh, I think we can do a lot of good in the schools. Great, one, one or two final questions before we wrap up. And again, we'll send out everything on Monday. All right. Well, Eric, thank you again for being here today, for giving up your time for what the, the work you've done in this area. It's amazing. And I think, honestly, every I think every church youth group especially needs to be able to to hear this. Uh, I think all Christian leaders and parents and Christian educators, I think um, that that will just help us to advocate or to not um, what do you call it? give away our rights and to be able to, to be there and, and be that light in a dark world. So thank you for being here. Thank you all for joining us. And um, I hope that you all have a blessed weekend. Thank you so much. Good to be with you.